I was born and brought up in Swansea, South Wales. That interest in theatre was always there. I'd been working in the theatre in Britain. I had done a degree, finished a degree in chemistry, funny enough, and I was shortlisted for a research post, which I didn't get. And I saw the chance to come out to New Zealand to teach taught at Marna College and I thought good chance have a look at the theatre I'll be even nearer Australia. You had to do two years under contract anyway of course when I came there was no professional theatre but there was very strong theatre, strong amateur theatre, very similar to repertory in Britain funny enough. But whether I would have stayed I'm fairly sure I would have because I loved it from the beginning I thought why do I want to live anywhere else? <laughs> I had a chance that I would never have had in Britain. I was in at the foundation of the modern professional theatre. And what's more, later on, of course, I had the chance to be involved in the second professional theatre in Wellington, which the odds against that are huge in Britain. The first lady of New Zealand theatre, Nola Miller, saw me working in something that I had written, which was a one-act version of Henry V. I did it for 30, 35 minutes cut it down, put some nice music in, had to get the story going. She must have seen that, I think. And very shortly she asked me, would I come to Wellington and play in the new Unity Theatre in Arrow Street? That was the beginning of my involvement in Wellington Theatre, which of course very shortly after, the group came together and formed Downstage. And we were asked to, one or two of us were asked to be in the play that opened the a theatre restaurant. The time came when we needed a drama school. We used to send people overseas, of course. They went overseas to get their training. Some of them came back, very few. And older New Zealanders looking at television in the 70s and 80s would see people that they knew as young actors here who'd gone to Britain to drain and stayed there. But then, of course, we had the New Zealand Drama School was founded at NOLA's place up there. And eventually that was established on very formal grounds with the government as the New Zealand Drama School, which then morphed into Toifakari. It was the first ad that involved a single presenter talking simply to the audience. It's the first time New Zealand had done that. It was the takeoff of a British ad, and that wasn't unknown. Of they had a personality there. 30 seconds of a little jokey, uh, little jokey tale, turn sideways and eat the Moro bar. Now, add to the fact it was unique, it was a brilliant bar, and they said to me it was made in Dun uh, opened first in Dunedin where they made the bars. Oh, it'll be come to New Wellington about six months. Took two years to get to Wellington, that uh, they couldn't make enough Moro bars. I then had left teaching and had gone into the DSIR to become a forensic toxicologist. I was there for about six years while working at Downstage. Right through that, my involvement became more and more. I realized I couldn't do the two jobs. And then I did a TV ad for a Moro bar. And at the same time, introducing the breathalyzer from the laboratory to New Zealand as a forensic scientist. And on town and around one night, uh, they had a clip of me talking with the uh, traffic police, as they were then known, explaining the, all the difficulties and the advantages of using the breathalyzer, as it was then, little Draga tube. First ad after that was the Moro ad. And I found myself in the director's office the following morning. <laughs> But as I explained, they knew that I worked in the theatre. I was still doing my job there. I was publishing papers, I was doing all this work. But eventually, you, you couldn't do two careers. Everybody knew that office. They either worked in it or they knew about that office, public service or not, any large office. When it was played at Circa, Roger, as he puts in his book, I met him on Lambton Quay and he said he'd written a play. And I said, we'd love to read it. It was called Hard Day at the Office at that point. And it was changed eventually to Glide Time. And we opened that to immense audiences in the small theatre. The review took about half a week to come out, but long before that, you couldn't get a seed. It was a watershed of writing. Uh, 
You mentioned they made a television play. What always annoys me about that is not the fact I wasn't in it, that <laughs> happens all the time, but the fact that it was made into a non-comedy, that the director, in my view, had the gall to turn it into something else when they should have written another play. It wasn't the tragic tale of the young office boy at all. And a director doing that to an established play, I think, is unforgivable. Television weren't interested in taking it any further. It's interesting, over five years, we own, and we did it twice on a Monday. Each episode was done twice on a Monday night with two different audiences, so that they could, in case of any emergency, or the director had a, a choice for cuts. And in that five years, we only ever stopped twice. We could hear the audience, of course, in the big Studio 8, that lovely studio that we've lost forever at Avalon, the audience sitting up there behind the cameras. We could play it, we could measure the laughs, we needn't step over laughs. We, it was just like, it was a live performance. And only twice, once when the boss went to his door to open it and the handle came off, which we made a little bit of, but you couldn't, that couldn't cut. So we stopped then, and the second time was when one of the extras was wheeling on a trolley full of beer for some celebration. And everything went well right up until the take, when the line from the camera, which normally had somebody behind looking after that line, was on the floor. The wheels hit it, and the beer came down. <laughs> We were up to there in bit. But that was the only twice we ever stopped in five years. Ross Jolly, who was also in it, he was a very good radio drama director. And in the building opposite the studios was the listener office, which was then the government listener. It was the listener of the um, Broadcasting Corporation, NZBC, I think it was then. And he went over and said, well, what about a front page of the old listener. Oh no, 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 we can't, we can't be seen pushing New Zealand program. Now, you tell that to people today, they won't believe it. They just won't believe it. Cloud9, a company that came out here to produce television, I did a piece for them called William Tell. I had to ride a horse. We did some training. And on the very first scene where I'm on this horse, we came up and Andrew was on one, I was on this white mare, and Peter Mackenzie, Brett's father, was wrangling the horses, a brilliant horseman. And some order is given to him, the peasants are revolting, go and sort them out, and off his horse went. The horse I'm on, two years before, was a steeplechaser, and he did, wasn't used to coming second. And suddenly, this horse is off. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Lloyd Scott had arrived on the set at that moment, and he said to me after, God, I said to the number one, Ray can ride, can't he? I said, you weren't close enough to see the horror in my eyes. <laughs> of course, I had a lot of sympathy from the, the, the crew. They all shouted out things like, if you get to Brooklyn, bring back some cigarettes. <laughs> It's wonderful. We have become, uh, Carolyn, of course, was a judge now, was in the common room in Auckland when she was sitting in the court up there, and one of her colleagues said, do you mind if my daughter comes in to talk to you? Carolyn said, no, no, perhaps you're going to do law or something. I said, why is that? Your dies, mum. And we have become dies, mum and dad, which is fabulous. <laughs> and he said to me that he grew up in the theatre, and to him, it's a job. He's seen Dad going off to work all his, all his life, and that's how he, he has a very good approach to his life as a professional, and that's great.